Grand. Well, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming along to this uh, session on uh, dissecting Dawkins' defense of uh, the God delusion, uh, the famous uh, new or neo atheist uh, polemic that he came out with in 2007. So now he's brought out a uh, uh, 10th anniversary edition. I was just uh, looking it up on uh, Amazon. And you can see it here, 10th anniversary edition, and uh, it's well within uh, the, the, uh, the 2,000 top-selling books. It's number one under the category of agnosticism and atheism, number two under books on philosophy of uh, religious and spirituality books, number two under books on science and religion. Uh, so although this uh, in bulk has been out there for a long time, it is still uh, being a hugely influential opinion shaper uh, in Western culture. Dawkins has written a new uh, foreword, a new introduction uh, to his book in which he defends himself against what he sees as the, the primary critiques that have been lodged uh, against his book. And he begins by talking about what he calls the God temptation the God temptation. He says, it's the temptation to evade by invoking a designer the responsibility to explain. Um, and we'll unpack more this idea of his that uh, saying that there's a designer such as God who explains things about the universe uh, does no such thing in his opinion. But I think we can already see here a, a kind of uh, begging the question on his part against the whole notion of there being a designer or indeed a god. I mean, if there is a designer, then to appeal to design uh, precisely is to offer a true explanation, one that uh, advances your knowledge over not knowing that. Um, and yet uh, Dawkins calls this uh, the temptation that we need to avoid from the beginning. Well, what is uh, more specifically the, the problem with design that tempts us to this uh, non-explanation as he sees it? Well, Dawkins says that you and I and every other living creature are machines of ineffable complexity complexity of a magnitude to challenge credulity. And he defines what he means by complexity, which, uh, as a philosopher, I appreciate it when people define what they mean for me. So he says, complexity here means statistical improbability in a non-random direction, the direction of seeming there's his philosophy keeping in again, seeming designed for a purpose. I think that actually Dawkins is here acknowledging the kind of thing that intelligent design theorists talk about under the rubric of specified complexity. Uh, that this type of complexity that is specified, and I'll unpack that again in a moment, uh, is a plausible indicator of genuine design. Indeed, in an op-ed for a Free Inquiry magazine a number of years ago, uh, from 2004, Dawkins wrote this about specified complexity. He said, specified complexity takes care of the sensible point that in the unique, the particular disposition or arrangement of its parts, a pile of detached watch parts tossed about in a box is as improbable as a fully functioning, what he calls genuinely complicated watch. But what is specified about a watch, what, what picks out or marks out the watch from all of the other arrangements of watch parts that you might get by shaking your box of bits about, what's specified about a watch, he says, is that it is improbable in the specific direction of telling the time. 
So there's this conjunction of improbability, which all of the arrangements of bits exhibit, but it's the conjunction of that improbability with this specific uh, function or pattern uh, that uh, is actually something that in our day-to-day -day experience uh, rightly tips us off to design. William Lane Craig gives a nice concrete example uh, of this when he's uh, introducing the notion of specified complexity and says, in addition to high improbability or complexity, they're basically the same thing, there also needs to be a conformity to an independently given pattern. And when these two elements are present, we have specified complexity, which is a tip-off to design. So here's the example. He says, for example, in a poker game, any deal of cards is equally and very highly improbable. It's one deal of cards out of all of the possible arrangements of cards of that number of deals from the pack. And he says, but if you find that every time a certain player deals, he gets all four aces, you can bet this is not the result of chance, but that it's the product of design. So at an organic level, Dawkins talks about what we might call the organic design problem or temptation. He says every animal embodies a statistical complexity of detail. Uh, every animal exhibits improbability in a non-random direction, in other words. That is, every animal exhibits specified complexity. Uh, he says the complexity, by which, of course, we know now that he means specified complexity, of the living body, indeed of every one of its trillion cells, is so mind-shattering to anyone who truly grasps it that the temptation to buckle at the knees and succumb to a non-explanation of, oh, design, is almost, almost overwhelming, he says. At a cosmic level. There's a, a temptation, a problem of design as well. He says the laws and constants of physics, the general structure of the cosmos, are fine-tuned in such a way as to set up the conditions under which eyes and peacocks and humans with their brains and so on can come into existence. Not just any kind of universe will do if you want to have life. This is a fascinating quote from him. He says, it's almost as though you have to have faith that it really is only a trick. Faith that nothing supernatural has happened. And if you've read much Dawkins, you'll of course know that by faith, he thinks the word means blind faith. And that's all it can mean. So he's saying, it's almost as though you just have to have blind faith that nothing supernatural has happened to explain these things. But, of course, he thinks it is a temptation to be avoided. It is a non-explanation. And he appeals to Darwin. He says, Darwin patiently tells us exactly how the trick of life works. It's cumulative natural selection. Well, it's interesting to see recently the atheist philosopher Michael Roos uh, noting that we have today a vocal anti-Darwinian party consisting, somewhat surprisingly, not only of the evangelical Christians of the American South, you know, you'd expect it of that, that bunch, as far as he's concerned, but of some of today's most eminent atheist philosophers. So there is a sort of in-house atheist debate that we can point to here. It is worth noting. For example, the atheist philosopher Jerry Fodor says uh, he makes this distinction between uh, phylogeny or the idea of common descent. That could be true even if adaptationalism, adaptation by natural selection, uh, isn't true. 
The classical Darwinist account of evolution as primarily driven by natural selection, he says, is in trouble on both conceptual and empirical grounds. An appreciable number of what he calls perfectly reasonable biologists, or which I'm pretty sure he means not religious ones, <laughs> are coming to think that the theory of natural selection can non no longer be just taken for granted. Or atheist Thomas Nagel, in his uh, recent book, Mind and Cosmos, which caused such a stir. Um, and you can see why, if you can note the subtitle there, it's a little uh, small on the screen, but the subtitle is why uh, the materialistic uh, uh, neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. This is from a prominent atheist philosopher. He says that the dominant scientific consensus, recognizing that it is the consensus, faces problems of probability that I believe are not taken seriously enough, both with respect to the evolution of life forms through accidental mutation and natural selection, which Dawkins appeals to, and with respect to the formation from dead matter of physical systems capable of such evolution. How do you get life able to evolve in the first place? The more we learn about the intricacy of the genetic code and its control of the chemical processes of life, the harder those problems seem. Indeed, so far as that question of, of how do you get life able to evolve by natural selection in the first place, so far as that question of the origin of life goes, Dawkins' appeal to Darwinian natural selection is, of course, a complete red Herring. As the atheist philosopher of science Bradley Monton puts it in his book, uh, red herring, yes, sure, it's a phrase that uh, uh, philosophers use uh, to describe uh, a, 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 a sort of interesting, flashy idea that is a distraction from the real issue. Uh, it comes from the practice of um, in uh, trying to disrupt fox hunting, you might drag a smelly fish across the trail where the dogs are coming up as they're hunting the fox and they'll go off after the after the smelly fish rather than getting to the fox getting to the uh, uh, the fox yeah. so Monton says however life arose from non-life it didn't happen via the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection Darwinian evolution only comes into play once life already exists Darwinian evolution doesn't explain or even purport to explain how life came to arise in the first place. At the cosmic temptation level, Dawkins appeals to the, the multiverse idea. He says the multiverse theory, that, that there are billions of universes having different laws and constants. Uh, and, of course, we could only find ourselves in one of the minority of those universes whose laws and constants just happen by luck, by chance, to uh, enable our, our evolution, our existence. Um, he's sort of giving himself more rolls of the dice in order to make getting the number he wants more likely, as it were. So you could sort of um, put his argument more formally like this at the cosmic level. He's saying, look, obviously, if, and notice the if, if there were enough different universes, then the admittedly specified fine-tuning, i.e. being life-permitting nature of our universe, wouldn't be complex, wouldn't be unlikely in its existence enough to justify making a design inference from it. So his second premise, in order to get to the conclusion that we can avoid invoking design, his second premise obviously has to be there are enough other universes with differently tuned laws and so on to make the specific nature of our universe not unlikely enough to invoke design. But this, in red, what has he said to justify our belief in this premise? Hmm, interesting. Um, it's a little bit like the question of monkeys and Shakespeare. You know this, uh, this old 
or analogy of uh, if you gave enough monkeys, enough typewriters, and uh, long enough typing away randomly, they'd eventually produce the complete works of Shakespeare just by chance. Oh, well, okay, let's just grant for the moment that if X number of monkeys, however many you'd need, uh, existed for long enough with enough typewriters and enough paper and so on, then they could, by chance, type out the complete works of Shakespeare. But when I show you a copy of the complete works of Shakespeare, why is it that none of you would think to yourself, ah, I see, there must be a heck of a lot of monkeys somewhere. Anyone faced with the, the many monkeys ex hypothesis as an explanation for a book uh, is going to ask this question. Is there any independent evidence for the existence of the monkey typing pool <laughs> that you're referring to? And if there's no independent evidence, then they are actually quite rationally going to prefer the single author explanation over the many monkeys explanation. They're going to invoke design rather than chance. Well, I think it's the same with the fine tuning and the multiverse. And indeed, agnostic Jim Holt notes that since other universes are by defin definition not directly obs observable <coughs> by us, uh, the burden of proof here is clearly on those who want to claim that other universes exist. He's saying they do owe us that independent evidence before they can start appealing to them as a get-out-of-jail-free card for the design temptation. Theoretical physicist Brian Greene, I'm going to uh, quote uh, just a handful of non-Christian scholars on this, because that's great to do in apologetics. Uh, it doesn't uh, allow people to say, well, of course, they would say that they're biased, they're on your side. These guys uh, are not biased because of their religious beliefs. So Brian Greene says people should be skeptical of multiverse theories because there is no evidence supporting their existence. Uh, so he said that in 2016. In his recent best-selling book, Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, uh, theoretical physicist Carlo Rovelli says, I see no reason for rejecting a priori, um, that is, uh, without experience, the idea that there is more in nature than the portion of space-time we see. He's saying, well, maybe there could be. I suppose there could be other universes. But I haven't seen any convincing evidence so far. In the September 2016 edition of New Scientist magazine, which is hardly a hotbed of bed uh, of fundamentalist, evangelical, uh, American <laughs> skepticism about design, uh, Stuart Clark and Richard Webb talk about multiverses, and they say that the difficulty here is how you get convincing evidence for the existence of any of them. And indeed, they caution that by allowing every possibility besides the one you're probing to play out somewhere in the multiverse, science robs itself of its predictive power. Um, if you are going to just allow multiverse upon multiverse to exist, such that any arrangement of anything becomes not unlikely, then you know what need to explain anything at all in a scientific fashion beyond saying, well, I guess anything's likely to happen somewhere. We just happen to be in the universe where this is what's happened. There's loads of other universes where it didn't. <laughs> uh, so it's not surprising that it should happen somewhere. Might not this appeal to multiverses actually uh, cause trouble for the whole process of doing science itself? And in uh, April 2017, so just this last month, uh, Peter Voigt, uh, interviewed by Scientific American, said this, the problem with such things as multiverse theories is the multiverse did it is just not, not just untestable, but an excuse for failure. Instead of opening up scientific progress in a new direction, such theories are designed to shut down scientific progress. This 
same concern uh, by justifying a failed research program. Dawkins, uh, in the, uh, the bulk of the God Delusion, the original, uh, he appeals to Lee Smolin's theories uh, that have a sort of cosmological analogy to Darwinian evolution. Uh, he has this idea in which universes give birth to daughter universes, uh, which have mutated laws and constants that give birth to daughter universes with mutated laws and constants and so on. And this, ha I don't know the detail of this, but this is meant to happen <coughs> through the production of black holes. Well, I'm going to take these points in reverse order because I think they make better sense in reverse order, but William Lane Craig points out that these speculations about universes uh, begetting baby universes, daughter universes, via black holes, according to him, and he tends to know his stuff in this area, he says that idea has been shown to contradict quantum physics. But also, he says a fatal flaw in, in Smolin's whole evolutionary cosmic scenario is his assumption that universes that are fine-tuned for black hole production uh, would also be fine-tuned for the production of stable stars. And that assumption in, his, in the background of his theory has been shown not to be true. Uh, indeed, the most proficient producers of black holes, to so say spawn these other universes, would be universes that generate primordial black holes prior to star formation, uh, so that life-permitting universes would actually be weeded out by the cosmic evolutionary scenario that Smolin puts forward. So it's a kind of uh, self-defeating as a theory, according to Bill Craig, who also points out this interesting uh, argument that is really borrowing from Roger Penrose, as we'll see. Uh, Craig puts it this way, and I've uh, put this uh, lovely picture of the observable universe uh, up here, and a picture of our solar system to illustrate this point. Craig points out that if, if our universe were just one member of a sort of randomly ordered bunch of other universes, then it is vastly more probable that we should observe a much smaller universe, a much smaller area uh, of stability in which life can exist than we actually do observe. Because obviously the existence of a small area of stability capable of supporting life is much, much more likely than the existence of such a huge area of life-permitting stability. Roger Penrose, in his most recent book, uh, Fashion, Faith and Fantasy uh, in the New Physics of the Universe, uh, puts it like this. It says, consider how ridiculously cheaper, in the sense of improbabilities, it would be to simply produce, by mere random collision of particles, the entire solar system with all of its life ready-made, or even just a few conscious brains, maybe just by the random collision of particles, by luck, a few brains would pop into existence, uh, connected to some eyeballs on stalks, maybe, and these two brains would look at each other and go, oh, look, another brain. Uh, just by the random collision of particles. Well, if you've got enough random stuff going on, anything is going to happen somewhere, but that little bit of life happening just by chance is much, much more likely than the existence of the solar system, let alone our universe. Uh, so the problem is, says Penrose, why did we not come about in that way rather than from an absurdly less probable Big Bang and all of the uh, huge history of the universe and so on? It seems to me that this conundrum simply points to the incorrectness of this bubble universe, this multiple universe idea. And indeed, again, recently in New Scientist, February 2017, Sean Carroll, an atheist cosmologist that Bill Craig has debated, you can look it up on YouTube, uh, has an article in which he says, uh, he's arguing uh, that we should reject universes that lead to cosmic brains. We should reject theories of the cosmos that have the implication uh, that 
cosmic brains are popping into existence somewhere. Indeed, if that, if that is likely on your hypothesis, you could point out that, um, of course, it's quite likely that some of those brains might be under the delusion that they're existing in a really large universe that's stable and, and so on. It's, it's like putting yourself into the matrix with no way of testing whether you're in reality or not. Um, so again, it starts undermining your confidence. And can we really trust our observations and do science? Agnostic cosmologist Paul Davis says that these multiverse myth theories also, they merely shift the problem up a level from the universe to the multiverse, because under any physical theory of multiverses, there has to be a finely tuned universe-generating mechanism. There has to be some sort of sausage machine spitting out a whole load of sausages with slight differences in them. But to pop out lots of different universes, that mechanism itself has to be, in a sense, finely tuned. Why doesn't it just pop out a whole load of carbon copies of the same lifeless universe? And questions like this. So you're only kicking up the problem a stage rather than solving it. This is where Dawkins has to start getting philosophical. And uh, in uh, our last little section here, I will try and show why uh, he fails even here, uh, outside of his territory, uh, to uh, rebut this design <coughs> temptation. Just appealing to the science doesn't seem to do it for him. Let's go with his philosophy and see how he does. Well, his key point is this. He says, the designer himself that you're appe appealing to, in order to be capable of designing, would have to be another complex, statistically unlikely entity of the kind that we've been explaining. And, and in turn, that designer would then need the same kind of explanation. As he said in the first edition of The God Delusion, God would have to be highly improbable in the very same statistical sense as the entities he's supposed to explain. This argument, says Dawkins in his new introduction, remains intact and is inescapably devastating. Mm, we'll see about that. So we could try to translate what he's saying here and, and say, in other words, he's saying, if you explain the existence of anything with reference to the existence of some other thing that also needs an explanation, then you produce an explanatory regress, and that's a problem. Well, yes, you, you do produce a regress, but what is the problem here meant to be? Well, he says, if you're trying to explain something improbable, specified, it can never suffice to invoke an entity that is in itself at least as improbable. Really? Um, let me give you a counterexample. Um, here is a portrait, self-portrait, by the artist Rembrandt. Do you think we make an explanatory advance if we explain this very complex specific pattern in the painting in terms of the yet more complex existence of Rembrandt? I think the answer to that question is obviously yes. You would, you, would, you would understand this painting less if you didn't know about the existence of artists, or Rembrandt in particular, and his style, and so on and so forth. In order for an explanation to be the best explanation of something, <coughs> says Bill Craig, one needn't have an explanation of the explanation. Indeed, such a requirement would generate an infinite regress so that everything becomes inexplicable and science becomes impossible. But perhaps Dawkins is confusing an explanatory regress with an infinite explanatory regress, and that's the idea that that's meant to be the problem, that this appeal to design would generate an infinite explanatory regress that would never stop anywhere. <coughs> well, I'd agree with him that an infinite regress is to be avoided, uh, but I'd point out that while explaining A, by B 
doesn't in itself entail an infinite regress, the assumption that for an explanation to be the best, you have to have an explanation of it, well, that rule that he uses does generate an infinite regress. It's Dawkins that is invoking a rule that generates an infinite regress, but simply appealing to design to explain fine-tuning doesn't necessarily produce an infinite regress. Uh, perhaps Dawkins' use of the, the term suffice indicates the thought that, there, that no explanation that's complex in the sense of being unlikely and thus contingent could ever suffice as an ultimate explanation. Because after all, all contingent, all contingent things need an explanation and so specified complexity requires a design explanation uh, and infinite regress is to be avoided. Well, I'd agree again, but I'd note that although Dawkins has just unwittingly endorsed a version of the cosmological and the design arguments now, if that's what he's thinking, he makes the question-begging assumption that God, if he were to exist, can't be a necessary being rather than a contingent being. That God couldn't be a being whose non-existence is impossible. So Dawkins says, look, critics of my book, grasping at straws, have tried to deny that a God capable of designing something complex and thus contingent must himself be complex and thus contingent. That's like saying that if there's a God, he must be like the kind of being that you can create using these design your own deity fridge magnets. That God is the sort of thing that's, that's made out of contingent, separable, rearrangeable parts whose arrangement have a, a statistical complexity or unlikeliness <coughs> to them. It is to beg the question against the idea that there could be a necessary creator. Well, Dawkins thinks he, thinks he has an argument to convince us that if there's a God, he must be complex. He says, look, God has to be clever enough to calculate the value of all these physical constants in the fine-tuning. You call that simple rather than complex? Uh, God has enough bandwidth to listen to the prayers of billions of people. He must be almighty, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-singing and all-dancing, you know? Call that Simple? That's not simple, therefore it must be complex. There's an ambiguity in the language being used at this point. Dawkins quotes Richard Swinburne, the Christian philosopher, who says that theism uh, suggests for its one cause, or its ultimate explanation, a person with infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite freedom, and so on. And Dawkins interprets this as Swinburne saying that God is simple for Swinburne because there's only one of him. Yet that one God has enough bandwidth to listen to the prayers and praises of billions of people and so on. Dawkins has completely missed the point of what Swinburne is saying. It's not just the fact that there's only one God. It's that that God is simple in the sense of having infinite degrees of his qualities. <coughs> Swinburne says a person couldn't be a person if he had zero degrees of power, knowledge, freedom, etc. But to suppose a finite limit to these qualities in a being is less simple than to suppose no limit. To suppose an infinite degree of these qualities bound together eternally is to postulate the simplest kind of person that there could be. And that's the sense in which Swinburne means God is simple. Swinburne's point isn't just that there's only one God, but the, the, the God who exists doesn't just have some power, etc. It's metaphysically simpler uh, to think of God like that than to think in terms of um, a being that one could ask of that being, well, why does God have only that much power rather than more or less? See, so that's, that's more complicated as a theory. J. Wesley Richard notes that the doctrine of simplicity is principally the claim that God is not made up of parts like the fridge magnets that we can rearrange. Uh, 
God is not composite in the sense of being made up of elements or properties that are more fundamental than God himself is. So making the claim that God is simple in that metaphysical sense does not entail that God doesn't have distinguishable properties or that he isn't a trinity of persons and so on. Indeed, the agnostic philosopher Anthony Kenny responds to Dawkins' argument that, well, God must be complex because he can hear all of these prayers and do this and do that and do the other in this way. He distinguishes complexity of structure, like putting the fridge magnets together in the right order, putting the four aces together in the deal of cards, complexity of structure from complexity of function. And he uses the illustration of an electric razor or a cutthroat razor. He says, look, an electric razor is much more complex in the statistical sense than the cutthroat razor. But you can use the cutthroat razor to do a lot more things with than you can use the electric razor. The electric razor is so specifically complex that it really only can do one specific job, and that is you can use it to shave your hair with. I suppose you could use it as a paperweight, but you can't use it for many things. The cutthroat razor, I can shave with it. I can open letters with it. I can probably cut bread with it. I can use it as a screwdriver. I can use it as a paperweight. I can do more things with it, even though it's simpler in its form and structure, it has more that it can do. So showing, an argument showing that X does a load of stuff isn't an argument showing that X must be complicated in the sense of having a complex specificity to it. Dawkins replied to Kenny when he made this point, and he said this, I really don't see what you're saying. Well, as Thomas Nagel, atheist philosopher, says, he's saying this, God is not a complex physical inhabitant of the natural world. That's not what we're talking about when we invoke God as, a, as a, a, the best explanation for design in the universe. Must God be complex rather than simple? None of Dawkins' observations is an argument showing that to fulfill his job description, as it were, God must be complex and not simple in the relevant sense of complexity. Dawkins thus equivocates, means two different things uh, over the term complex and simple. And he's, he's trading on that ambiguity to hide uh, his uh, flawed uh, argument. He's begging the question underneath that ambiguity against the idea that God could be a metaphysically simple, necessary being who does halt the explanatory <coughs> regress that you get uh, from saying A needs to be explained in terms of B and, well, you, I don't think you should go on forever. Um, but the only way to stop going on forever, in a sense, is to invoke something that can produce specified complexity, but doesn't itself exhibit specified complexity in that same sense. And that's what the traditional concept of God gives <coughs> you. So think of it this way. If Dawkins had written a book called The Contingent God Delusion, he would have sold a lot fewer copies. <laughs> Dawkins' attempted rebuttal of the design argument, the design temptation, uh, does not, I think, remain intact, as he says. It has, I think, been subjected to inescapably devastating criticism uh, by folks like William Lane Craig and uh, John Lennox, who we have with us this week, and so on. As far as Dawkins shows, the, the apprehension of design that is just kind of intuitively obvious to most or many people, and which can be cashed out in much more uh, formal uh, logical terms when we start 
using the analysis of specified complexity and intelligent design theory and then trying to give the best metaphysical interpretation to that theory, all of that, I think, remains uh, a good reason or intuition uh, at the, the popular level uh, to believe that there is indeed a creator of heaven and earth. <coughs>